do so with reverence and awe. In a measure of sobriety, Lord, realizing that it's God speaking to us. That through your word, Lord, you teach us who you are. You teach us how to relate to you. You teach us how to walk with you. you teach us how to worship you. You teach us how to repent of things that are not in keeping with your character. And so, Lord, as we come to the word of God, we open our hearts and minds by the Holy Spirit and ask you, Holy Spirit, that you engraft in us the living word of God that would change us, that would mold us and shape us to be more like Jesus, more like him than when we walked into this gathering, that as we exit, that the word of God does its work in us to make us more complete. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, let's give a great cheer for the exciting book of Leviticus. Yes, all right, okay. <laughs> I've got to work that in. One of my grandchildren asked me the other day, when are you going to be finished with the book of Leviticus? Uh, it's an exciting book if you let it be. And so if you recall, uh, by the way, this is the third teaching. We're almost 25% of the way done, so... Don't cheer that one. We're looking at Leviticus chapter 3 today. We're not going chapter by chapter. We're looking at the main offerings that are in here and how they relate to us as New Covenant Christians, basically is what we're doing, and learning about uh, the duties of the priesthood because guess what? We're the priesthood now, so it applies to us. So uh, we're looking at Leviticus 3, and now if you recall last week, we learned about the primary offering that was necessary that God instituted so that the people could be forgiven of their sin and walk with the holy God. It was called the burnt offering, and it was consumed by fire, every single bit of it. There was nothing left. On the, uh, on the altar of atonement for the offer, the worshiper, atonement is God's act of dealing with the primary human problem of sin. He needs to have sin atoned for, covered for, removed, in our case, in the New Covenant, so that there can be relationship between a holy being and an unholy being, as it were. Said. God's eyes are too holy even to look on sin, much less have fellowship with it. So uh, when the pagans always complain, you know, why didn't God answer my prayer? It's because they haven't been atoned for. He's merciful, the rain falls on the just and the unjust, but he can't walk with those who retain their sin. Uh, indeed, as the Bible says, even love their sin and hate God. He's going to be merciful, but he is not going to be a companion to those that insist on living a sinful lifestyle. And so the bull became the main offering that got us into all the other offerings, and you'll see as we go along that it, it has something to do with each of the offerings. <clears throat> Excuse me. Even in the one we're going to cover today, which is a much lighter version of what I'm going to talk about today, it, it also involves blood. All the offerings to, to one degree another involve blood because it reminds us that we're in constant need of forgiveness before a holy being. So there's blood everywhere, but uh, that, that's because the life of the animal substitutes for the sinful person. And so we see that through the, that, was, that was the burnt offering. Today we're going to look at no, another one of the five major offerings today. This one's called the peace offering. And it's in Leviticus chapter 3. Uh, let's read verses 1 through 5. If his, if his offering is a sacrifice of peace offering, if he offers an animal from the herd, male or female, he shall offer it without blemish before the Lord. And he shall lay his hand on the head of the offering and kill it at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And Aaron's sons, the priests, shall throw the blood against the sides of the altar. And from the sacrifice of the peace offering, as a food offering to the Lord, he shall offer the fat covering the entrails and all the fat that is on the entrails. And the two kidneys with the fat that is on them, on the loins, and the long lobe of the liver that he shall remove with the kidneys." Then Aaron's son shall burn it on the altar on top of the burnt offering, which is on the wood, on the fire. It is a food offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. Uh, is anyone else suffering allergies? I am struggling up here. I apologize for that. I need to just doctor myself a little bit here. I need to You can, all this mother's sitting in front of me, you can really, no, you, no I don't want your clean. Yeah, I'm just suffering, so I'm not 
pop up on the screen at home and all you've got is clear screen. Mm -hmm. so, I, I need to do more Boy Scout flights. Look, Bob, I'll give you a pass here. <laughs> give that to Bob because he's got this thing screwed up. I apologize. Please let me take the pulpit seat. I turned my microphone off. <laughs> I thought I was doing good. There's nothing holy to be given to you. Hey, that reminds me of the story the first time I preached in Africa. It was 19... In 1986, I was preaching in Africa for the first time, and uh, I had to blow my nose. I mean, the dust, and the, it was just incredible what you have to deal with this. Ants crawling up your legs while you're preaching. It's hard to be prideful when you have to blow your nose in front of a congregation or ants are crawling up your legs. I, honestly, I was standing in dust, right? And I didn't realize that I was on an anthill, and the ants over there are this big. And the red ants will chew your flesh off. And I, I was, I'm constantly brushing my legs, and they're crawling up my legs while I'm preaching. You want to go to Africa next week? I mean, it's, 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 my cadence is good for him, but not good for me. <laughs> Suffering for me is seven degrees in the holy hotel room instead of 68. <laughs> in any case, uh, I'm preaching along, and I had to blow my nose. So I blew my nose in my handkerchief and put it back in. And I, as soon as I got done preaching, this group of men came up to me and say. Uh, what is that that you put in your pocket? And I said, excuse me? What did you do? What did you exit from your nose and put in your pocket? I said, a snot? I don't know. What? <laughs> and they said, we've never seen that before. We don't think you should do that because their version of blowing your nose is <laughs> in the meeting as well as spitting on the floor. So they could not conceive of a Westerner putting snot in their pocket inside of a piece of linen. It was, what? Isn't that weird? So you learn stuff as you go. Okay, that's off the track. Here we go. Back to get off the snot and get on to Leviticus. Here we go. <coughs> You'll notice there in uh, Leviticus, it says, All fat is the Lord's. Verse 17, I shall be a statue, it shall be a statue forever throughout your generations in your dwelling places that you eat neither fat nor blood. Now, <coughs> I'm not going to take the time because it's too lengthy, but we, we, we compare this with chapter 7, if you want to read for yourself, where there's further instruction what to do with this offering. It looks just like the burnt offering. But the difference is, in the burnt offering, every ounce of the burnt offering goes to the Lord to atone for your sin. In the peace offering, uh, just the entrails and the uh, certain other pieces our kidneys are burned, and the rest of the offering uh, meat is cut up and served to the Lord, the priests, and the people. It's called a, a peace offering, and you'll see those the instructions on how to eat it. So basically, we go from a burnt offering to a barbecue with Jesus. Right after the burnt offering. And it's a very significant offering, and it, it teaches us a lot. Uh, there's one thing you're going to be blessed by that Jesus says that always puzzled me. And I'll, I'll take, keep that to the end there. But quite a contrast between the two offerings. The burnt offering was totally consumed by fire. The peace offering, the portions of the animal were saved for eating. The peace offering uh, often accompanies the burnt offering hand and glove, like right after the atonement, there's this thing called the peace offering. The burnt offering for atonement was offered every morning and evening for sin. A lot of blood, a lot of butchering. I think the priests, after they got done with that, they worked at Deerberg's meat department or something because they were so used to butchering meat. The peace offering was not mandatory. It was a free will offering. It wasn't demanded by the Lord. It was something that the offerer said, I'd like to now give a peace offering. So it was out of their free will that they offered this. The peace offering in Hebrew is called Shal Amin, 
I didn't do well in Hebrew, so please forgive me, but Shel Amim. This is where the Hebrews get the word what? Shalom. Shalom to the Hebrews, get ready now, means peace, health, prosperity, communion, fellowship, to be complete, to be whole, to be at peace with those who could destroy you. And in this case, God. For when the offerer comes to bring his offerings, he's at war with God because of his sin. He's God's enemy. So the atonement is made, then the, the, the worshiper offers the peace offering out of incredible great gratitude for being forgiven. It also means soundness, completeness, security, harmony, concord, safety, assurance, shalom. So in that one small word, and this is the, this is the goal of all Hebrews, all the Old Testament, the, the desire of their hearts is to have shalom from God and with God. And so uh, that's how Revelation 22 ends in the Bible with shalom, but we'll get to that in a minute. <clears throat> uh, many scholars refer to this peace offering as the fellowship offering. So to highlight to you, everybody says, oh, Book of Leviticus is all about laws, about duty, and they had to do this and they had to do this. This was a free will offering that just said, thank you, God, that you have accepted this sacrifice on my behalf, and that I can know you, I can walk with you, I can have my sin forgiven. The fellowship offering still involved blood, as I already mentioned, uh, because forgiveness of sin was a continual thing. <coughs> Excuse me. But the sober event of the burnt offering has turned into a feast with the Lord. You're actually dining with the Lord after the atonement. That's why I'm saving the communion meal to the end, because we're going to kind of practice just a little bit of what it was like to then enter into a meal together uh, because of shalom. It was a happy, joy-filled covenant meal with the Lord after the burnt offering. The worshiper loves God so much and is so grateful to be forgiven that he of his own free will made this non-demanded sacrifice to the Lord to say, thank you and I love you. And God responds by, now we dine. Isn't that beautiful? How wonderful. The peace offering underscores the entire spirit of the book of Leviticus. God's goal in sacrifices, God's goal in sacrifices uh, is this. I will be your God and you will be my people. Connection with God, intimacy with God, fellowship with God, shalom with God. The peace offering sort of made things clear as to who was just doing their duty and who really loved God and wanted to enjoy this moment with him after the burnt offering. It wasn't demanded. And so you could see Paul then saying, not all Israel is Israel. They didn't love God because it wasn't in their heart to love God. They say, okay, what do I have to do? What's the bare minimum? What does he want now? Those are called unregenerate people, non-covenantal people. Oh, they may have a, the label of Israel, but they're not Israel. Now, I'm not saying that. Paul said that. So just because your last name ends in M-A-N, Goldman, Silverman, whatever, does not mean that you have communion with God. You're all staring at me. It's okay. It's all right. Uh, we'll do another teaching sometime more in detail on who are the people of God because that's one of my chapters in my second book to help people understand who are the people of God that's being addressed in the book of Revelation, indeed in the whole Bible. <coughs> Excuse me. So Psalm 56, 13, and 14 is a possible reference to what the worshiper would say at the peace offering. It reads this way, I will render a thank offering to thee, for thou hast delivered my soul from death, yea, my feet even from falling, that I might walk before God in the light of life. The gratitude for being forgiven was so overwhelming that they had to bring another sacrifice to, 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 to say thank you. And uh, so that's what they did. Deuteronomy 12, 7 the Lord says, you shall eat before the Lord your God and you shall rejoice. 
you and your households, in all that you undertake, in which the Lord your God has blessed you. This is such an unusual offering, but it sets the tone right in the first three chapters that Leviticus, dare I say this, is a book of grace and of God's mercy. It's not just laws. It's the grace of God, and it shows you the spirit that God has always carried about, even in the duties we were to perform. In this covenant meal, the fat and the blood belong to the Lord. Verse 16b, all fat is the Lord's. You shall not eat fat nor blood. That was a commandment uh, to all Hebrews to never partake of those things. Now, why? <coughs> Excuse me. When we think of fat, we think of the white milky stuff that you cut off your steak that you don't really digest. Maybe Phil does. I don't know because he eats all kinds of things. But at the same time, Normally, we cut the fat off, and it's like somewhat undesirable. You with me? But fat here, F-A-T in Hebrew understanding, is the best cut of the meat. Hence, we have the, we have the saying, the fat of the land. You know that kind of saying? It, it means the best cut, the filet mignon of the offering goes to God. The very, that's me, that's the fat. So the Hebrews don't get the fat. God reserves that for himself. So he's training them that I'm your first choice. I'm the choicest of your whole life is what it declares. The fat was the best cut, only the best for the Lord. And so he was training them. Don't just give me, throw something in the basket towards me. I want your life. I want your spirit behind it. I want your soul behind it. I want your mind behind it. And that was training the people not just to do their duty, but to give their hearts and lives to the Lord as well. Now, the blood is a little easier. Fat is a portion of the sacrifice, the best portion. I said filet mignon. Maybe there's other parts that are better. I don't know. Isn't it? <laughs> filet mignon is the best? Yeah. All right, whatever. Uh, I go to Olive Branch. Uh, they're great people. Um, I come on gallons of sweet tea that they make. They're all proud of their sweet tea. I'll drink a gallon on the way home. Then I go into a diabetic coma. But there's one individual named Keith. And I can always count. I never take offerings from our related churches, by the way. But the people love to give me stuff. So they bake me stuff. I bring home all kinds of stuff for Molly. Molly gets more stuff than I do. They make things for Molly. It's pretty cool. But anyway, um, there's one gentleman there named Keith, and I really love him. He's great. And he gives me two, I guess, deer mignons from, from venison wrapped in bacon. And, oh, it is so good. You know, you know what I'm talking about. What I'm, I never got my own, Jeff. I get it given to me. But all I'm saying is that, that is some fine eating. Uh, all right, we're going to eat lunch in a second, so you can just bear with me. I'm thinking of food, too. <clears throat> now, the blood is a little easier to understand. Blood represents what? Life. The life of the animal. They weren't to drink blood because the blood belongs to the Lord. The life of the animal belongs to the Lord. He created that animal. It's his ownership. <coughs> And so you're giving back to him what is already his. Sounds like the tithe, doesn't it? But in any case, the people were forbidden from eating uh, the fat and the blood because those belong to the Lord. Psalm 50, verses 12 through 14, uh, reminds us God doesn't need food. In case you're getting all squirrely on me here, like God comes down with a knife and fork and a bib on or something. No, no, that's not what's happening here. It's a little more sober than that. God doesn't need food. He says in Psalm 50, If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world and all its fullness is mine. Do I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving. He's not going to partake of the food. Who partakes of the food in this scenario? I said it to you already. Who? Three people. God, the priest, and the worshiper. Okay. The priests are representatives of God. So this is one of the wonderful benefits of their job is when the peace offering comes, not only do the priests eat it, the worshiper can bring the portions home and share it with his family. 
and talk about the goodness of God. So it's really a c pretty cool offering. And it always follows the burnt offering if you want to. By giving God the fat, the best part, the worshiper was declaring, I'm giving you, God, the best part for you that you have given me the best part. I'm giving you the best part of this sacrifice because you have given me the best part of you. Now, New Covenant Christians, what is the best part of God that he gives us? Jesus. So, Bear with me. The believer who's in this sacrificial mode and everything is not offering a mere bull. It's representative of the Christ. And so innately he knows that because he's saved. There's only one way you can be saved in the Bible. It's by the name of Jesus. I don't have time to go through it, but... We've got this bifurcation because of dispensationalism that says, no, they're saved one way and we're saved. No, there's only one way under heaven. God says concerning Abraham, he had the gospel preached to him beforehand. He believed on Jesus is why he was given righteousness. Okay. The kidneys and the fat around the kidneys were all burned. The kidneys and intestines in the Old Testament uh, refer to the seat of the emotions. Whenever you read about kidneys or uh, intestines or anything, it's not the physical thing they're relating to. It, it's, it's a pouring out of emotions. Like we would say to somebody, I love you with all of my heart, right? So they, they would talk about f things flowing from their kidneys, and it sounds like a biological experiment, but it's not. It's, just, it, it, it's, it's in essence saying all my emotions uh, are in mourning for my son. All my emotions are in thanksgiving to God is what it means. So when the kidneys and the intestines That's worship through the medium of eating a meal together. Peter, you are forgiven. I love you. We are at peace. Shalom. I think Peter was full of a little bit of trepidation, saying, i got to face Jesus, and I just sinned against him. You know, what do I say? What do I do? But here God has already prepared the meal, saying, I've already forgiven you. There's, did you notice that Peter doesn't say, I repent, I really feel sorry for what I, he did, he just eats. <laughs> because he knows this is the peace offering. I've been accepted again, even though I denied the Lord. Isn't that beautiful? So you're going to you're going to view food differently in the Bible now that you know these things. Now here's my favorite part of this, and then we're going to um, wrap it up, believe it or not. I always wondered why Jesus said when it came to 
the Lord's Supper. I have longed to eat this meal with you. That's always puzzled me. You know you're going to die. You know this is you're going to be the sacrifice and all this. What is it about this? Why do you long to have this meal? I think it's the heart of God himself. Okay, let's get through this burnt offering so we can dine. We can be together. And even before he was crucified, he fed them. It speaks volumes to the disciples. So let's look at just a few points more here. The Lord's Supper becomes the shalom offering in the New Covenant. I am convinced of this. All right, I, I've studied this hard and long. And uh, a lot of scholars will just focus on the Passover meal and associate it with Exodus. And that's rightful. That's, it was Passover meal. But I believe with all my heart that Jesus also used it as the peace offering to send a declaration to the disciples of what life was going to be like in the new covenant. So at both meals, the peace offering in the old covenant and in the new covenant, it was demanded that the worshiper be clean to eat the meal. Meat was only for the forgiven and the regenerate. Remember, it's a free will offering. Pretty unlikely that a guy who has hardness of heart is going to spare another bull after one is already sacrificed to say thank you. I did my duty. I did the bare minimum. And if you think you're a Christian and you're living like that, you might need to examine yourself. Because our gratitude level is not just, oh yeah, uh, you know, thanks today, the sun came up. It's not casual. His mercies are new every morning. You lived through the night. He could have taken your life if he wanted to. It belongs to him. And so you wake up every morning with the first thought being, thank you, Jesus. Okay. Number two, at both meals in the Old Covenant and New Covenant, the worshiper gave thanks to God with a grateful heart for his merciful forgiveness. Both meals recognize that. Number three, at both meals in the Old Covenant and New Covenant, the Lord is present in the Old Covenant through the priests, his representatives. The Lord is present. In the New Covenant, Christ, the high priest, is present. So when we come to this simple little meal, we are dining with the king. Keep that in mind before you just throw down the morsels and chug down the thing and get on with it. You are dining with the king. And we're dining with the king as royal children around the Lord's table together. So we should recognize that in one another. I see in you the glory of my king, we used to sing at New Covenant all the time. I hated singing to people, by the way. It was, that was awful. I, hate, I tried to go to the bathroom whenever they say, now sing this to you. I don't like doing that. So you don't, you don't have to sing it, but the spirit of it is, Rhea is not just Rhea in the flesh, okay? She, she's, a, she's a part of the royal family. And we should treat her as such. You know, if, if the English royal family came through those doors, and wouldn't that be a kick? Came through there with all the regalia on. I don't think we say, pull up a chair, you know, have a cup of tea. Uh, yeah, here, we'll get you here. Do whatever you want. We probably, oh, what can I get you? There would be a different attitude we would have. We need to think about each other that way, from the lowest to the greatest. Finally, number four, meat was consumed at the Old Covenant meal. Bread and wine are consumed at the New Covenant meal. <coughs> Excuse me. By eating and drinking in both covenant meals, the worshiper is reminded that salvation has been achieved. And in both meals, if you don't mind me saying, by the Christ. Salvation has been achieved. That God is with us in this life and forever in the life to come. This is how they came to make their peace offering sacrifice with this attitude and finally that God bestows covenant favor and blessing on the one eating and drinking 
So it's not just, uh, here, get your fill and, you know, go back to your chairs. But you can expect God, Jesus, who is present. You know, over here, everybody, over here. You can expect God, who is present, uh, dining with you to bless you, to bestow on you favor and blessing. Because this is a table of blessing, not curses. It's a table to unlock the covenant blessings. All right. So that pretty well wraps it up. Are there any other meals that I haven't covered? Hmm, let's see. There's still one. I don't know who brought me flowers, but it was an awkward moment. <laughs> There's still one more meal. The marriage supper of the Lamb. Wow, we're eating this meal prepared by God himself, Isaiah 25. Maybe forever. And for an Italian man, that would be perfect. I'm guessing there's something going on after we're done here. In any case, um, we're dining in this meal with the Lord himself. Ready? Not just spiritually present face to face because ultimate shalom has been achieved sin is no more death is no more failure is no more sickness is no more and while we're eating we can smell this probably isn't very good what I'm saying here but all of God's enemies and ours burning in a lake of sulfur a lake of fire while we dine with the king. Ready? Forever. It'll be perfect shalom. Perfect prosperity. Listen, you can have prosperity in this life, but it's only tasting of the powers of the age to come. Don't go crazy. Remember, over-realized eschatology gets you in trouble. Not everybody gets healed. Not everybody gets rich. But in this case, Everything is loosed of blessing, and there are no curses left. There are no disciplines left. We've arrived at perfect shalom. So as we partake of this meal together this morning, our hearts are full and bursting with gratitude and thanksgiving that shalom has been achieved through Jesus Christ for you and me, that God is no longer our enemy. He is our friend. He is our Lord, he is our God, and we can know him and love him and enjoy him forever because of Jesus Christ. That's what this table means. But it also projects us to the final meal. It's just a portion. It's an appetizer to say, we are headed somewhere, folks. Be patient. Walk with the Lord. Receive his disciplines until you arrive at perfection and immortality, all by God's grace. And along the journey, he will nourish you and satisfy you and bless you. So we're going to break bread now. And you just receive the shalom of God while you're taking the meal. Maybe you can, if you'd like, take a little extra piece of bread. And when we go to the tables, you can break bread with whoever's sitting with you and say shalom to you. All that Steve said shalom is shalom to you because of Jesus. Now, Father, we come to this table with hearts bursting with gratitude and thanksgiving. We thank you and praise you. And we ask in Jesus' name that you inculcate in us the importance of all that you've prepared for us, all that you've done for us, all you've already achieved, and all what it means so that our life and everything we do has meaning. Even our trials all have meaning. Because you've made peace with us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We give thanks in Jesus' name. Could the stewards please come? <coughs> and could a member of each household please come and take the elements and then just sit down. We'll partake together and then we'll break for our other meal.